Welcome back. In part two of this series, I sketched my ancestors and their neighbors' Eastern European migration from Bohemia to three villages in what is now southwestern Ukraine, but was then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In this episode, we'll see what daily life was like for these settlers and why so many eventually pulled up stakes and headed farther east to Bukovina. To a surprising extent, much of our ancestors' daily life in what they universally called the old country was not that different from our own lives in rural Saskatchewan before electrification in 1956. Our farms were larger, to be sure, but like them we lived without electricity. We grew our own vegetables, we hunted game, milked cows, raised chickens and pigs, and were about as self-sufficient as the ancestors were in Felicienthal. Like us, their meals were cooked on wood stoves, and their houses were heated by wood or coal, and water was drawn from a well. Similar to the one-room school in Felicienthal, where three of my grandparents learned proper German, we walked or traveled by horse to our own one-room school. Our Christmas concerts were lit by coal oil lamps. But unlike Felicienthal, our Christmas pageant was not a major regional event. However, we maintained an unusual connection to the old country as our school was named for a 17th century Bohemian statesman named Wallenstein, who is still celebrated around Heb, formerly Eger, on the western edge of the Czech Republic. Our farms produced cash crops, as did our ancestors in Felicienthal, who, like the Ukrainians we saw in 2003, worked their 15 or 20 acre plots of land to produce vegetables and grain. On our visit in 2003, we noted that the Denkevich household still kept cows, calves, chickens and horses, and when they generously treated us to a noon meal, the butter, eggs, sour cream, and vegetables were all sourced right here. Later, I'll dedicate an entire video to ancestral cuisine, but for now, simply note that nearly all the dishes we ate in western Ukraine were the same or similar to the food I grew up with. Pierogies and sour cream, for example. Like our ancestors, our social group was almost exclusively Roman Catholic, and like my great-great-grandfather old Johann Lang and Felicienthal, my elders helped build the churches that they attended in Raymore and Quinton. And we were gregarious, gathering in family and neighborhood groups of 20 or more on Sunday afternoons, as the ancestors did in the old days. Among themselves, my parents and grandparents often spoke German and sang traditional beer-drinking songs from the old country. In this old 8mm clip, you can almost hear them singing Ja, 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 weiß nicht wie gut ich dir bin from the song Du, du, liegst mir im Herzen. And in our larger community, other families spoke Hungarian, Ukrainian, or Polish, just as families in Felicienthal had a hundred years earlier. 
However, with daily interactions among other groups in the villages, my grandparents learned to speak several languages, including Ukrainian, which they spoke when they didn't want my parents' generation to understand. And finally, like the old country, our ancestors landed in a foreign land among a majority population that did not speak German. Once again, the story of my ancestors is the story of thousands who lived in so-called language islands, communities of German speakers surrounded by a sea of Poles, White Russians, Hungarians, and Ukrainians. There in the old country, minorities though they were, theirs was also the official language of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, spoken by about one quarter of its subjects. In 1983, my father, John Lang, son of Max, son of Ferdinand, son of Johann, the church builder, explained, And they, then our Austrian people were sent into their different countries to Germanize the Hungarians, the Czech, the Yugoslav, the Serb, and the Bohemians. However, significantly, my ancestors did not arrive in Saskatchewan to Germanize Canadians. Rather, the government's intention was to Canadianize them. In another parallel, our ancestors in Felicienthal were surely viewed askance in their new surroundings, given they represented an empire that was unpopular with its non-German speaking subjects. And then there's the matter of religion. Under the Habsburgs, Roman Catholicism was a state religion, and most of our ancestors were devout parishioners. Their religion dominated their lives, from being named according to the saint of the day, to having baptismal certificates serve as state birth certificates. Religion and language were the dual cornerstones of our ancestors' culture, which is why each village sought to have its own church and German school. In Felicienthal, St. John the Pomac was the heart of the community, located directly across from the German school. For more than 60 years, our ancestors were taught in German. But the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 gave Western Galicia to Poland. One day in 1925, Felicienthal children arrived to find a Polish teacher and all their books in Polish, yet not one of them spoke a word of Polish. As the epicenter of the village, St. John the Pomac was the site of weddings, baptisms, and funerals. The church was named for a Bohemian priest who was thrown off the Charles Bridge in Prague in the year 1393, as ordered by King Wenceslaus. Not always a um, good King Wenceslaus, I guess. The event was recorded in many pieces of art in Prague, including the massive St. Vitus Cathedral that towers over the entire city. Felicienthal's church could fit into one of the cathedral's side chapels. Humble though it was, its builders contracted a professional painter to festoon the walls and ceiling with biblical portraits. Completed in 1860, St. John the Pomac stood for nearly 150 years. Following an infant baptism in 2006, a fire started in the electrical panel and the church was burned to the ground. Its ashes mark the end of an era as a new Ukrainian Catholic church has since been erected on the spot in the village, which is now called Dolinivka. The crumbling cemetery alone marks our family's history in this village, a history that took another turn around 1900. At that time, most families augmented their meager income from their few acres by operating small businesses. For example, 
This Hartle family made spinning wheels. Others made boxes. This Geisbauer made wooden shoes, which, by the way, were daily footwear for most villagers. It was said that properly insulated with straw, good wooden shoes kept feet warm even on ice. Next to the church and the school, the market was the main gathering place. Located in Shmorja, on the west end of town, where the population was mostly Ukrainian and Jewish, wares, stock, and produce were bought and sold. This is the sole existing photo of the market. At the eastern end of Shmorja, where the Shmorzanka River loops across the road, there was a grist mill owned and operated by my great-grandfather Ferdinand Lang. This is the only known photo of the mill, generously provided by Joyce Gursky Scott. Villagers brought their rye grain to the mill to be ground into flour. These are photos of a similar mill, now a museum. Felicienthal and its sister villagers appear idyllic in many ways, so one wonders why would so many families want to leave? The answer simply is that there was no more room to grow. After several decades and several generations, the available land was insufficient to provide sustainable futures for young Felicienthalers, Anna Burgers, and Karlsdorfers. Word circulated of opportunities in Bukovina, 300 kilometers to the east. And so, Ferdinand Lang sold the mill to his nephew Alois, and like dozens of other villagers, he packed up his growing family and moved to the village of Jadova, near Chernovitz, or Chernovitsky, Bukovina. In the next episode, we meet the interwoven families of Bukovina. War looms and stories of free land in Canada spread. And families fracture as the final migration turns to the wild west of the Canadian prairie.